again as usual, I have a lot to say. So I stole some time from you to search you for meditation earlier. When I can talk uh, slowly and not worry about how long I take, it's easier for me to talk. When I have to look at the clock again and again and hurry, sometimes I cannot make the ideas connected properly. But anyway, today, it doesn't matter how long, I'll keep going. Time is ticking away so fast. I have so much to say and not enough time. I only have another two or three chances to meet you on Sundays. <clears throat> so, what I want to talk about today, I've been thinking about it for quite a long, long time. For many, many years I've been thinking about it. And I've tried to talk about it a few times. And still there are a few more things that I think I want to talk about and things that I believe that you are also very, very interested in. What is that? To say that in very briefly, in brief, what are we living for? That's something I want to talk about. And I think most of you are also very interested in that. That's the question I've asked myself since I was quite young. What am I living for? And another way of asking is, what do I really love to do? The meaning is the same actually. The words are different. But it means the same. What am I living for and what do I really love to do? It's the same. If you answer both questions, you'll get the same answer. And this is still really important for us if we don't know what we are living for. And if we don't know what we really love doing, then our life is meaningless. There's no purpose to live anymore. So this is very important. So to begin the story from the very beginning, when we were born, from on the day that we were born, what was the most important thing for us to survive. That was the most important thing. The moment we were born, the most important thing for us was to survive, to go on living. So that's, for that time in our life, that was the most important thing. No other purpose, just to live. So our parents looked after us, gave us nourishment, uh, take care of us, so we grow up slowly and slowly. So the moment we can see and hear, our motives change a little bit. Even a few months, three, four months, we get interested in our surroundings. On the day we were born, we were not interested in anything. Just close your eyes and sleep, and suck milk, and go back to sleep. But after a few days, maybe a few months later, we get interested. We look around and see people. Who are these people? And we get used to seeing our parents, our mother especially, and get attached to our mother. And the, the voice of the mother also makes us feel very safe, warm. And the mother holding us in her, um, what do you call, bosom, close to her bosom, makes us feel very safe, secure. And we love that. So we have a relationship with our mother. And also with our father, if we are brothers, we also have a relationship with our brothers. So that means relationships become important in our life. We are relating, we are related. Without that we cannot survive. If you keep a child, give it the nourishment, but don't relate to the child, don't talk, don't touch, what will happen? I think the doctors know the answer. Can you help? Just give milk. Don't touch. Don't talk. Keep it warm and safe, yes. But don't do anything. Don't relate to the child. The child will die. So just nourishment coming into our mouth is not enough for us to survive. We need more than that. 
So relationship is nourishing. This is very, very important to understand. Without good relationship, we cannot survive. We cannot become a human being even. So, a few days later, we need the relationship. We need to be touched. We need to be talked to. Even though we don't understand. We need to feel that we are wanted, we are loved, we are cherished, we are valued. Even though we cannot speak, we can feel that. Most people think that a child who cannot speak uh, don't feel anything. Don't feel the need for this relationship. No. Even before a child can speak, a child needs that. So, nourishment, food, and nourishing relationship is very important. So we grow up slowly and slowly, bigger and bigger, stronger and stronger. We crawl, we move about. Movement, exploring the world. We won't stay in a place. No. The moment we, we have enough food and sleep, we want to move. Develop, to develop our potential, our hands, our legs. We want to use them. That is very important. If we don't use our hands and legs, if we don't explore the world, we don't grow. So we develop our potentials and grow up and grow up. Explore the world. The home, the surrounding. And if we have brothers and sisters or even younger children around us, we want to relate to those people also. Play with those people. Take out, laugh. So we want relationship with uh, our peers, so to speak. Those who are about the same as our age. It is not enough just to relate to our parents. It is very important for us to relate to other people of the same age. So we grow up slowly and slowly. In one year, two years, ah, we can run, we can jump, we can play games. So we start playing with many things. Playing with toys, but that's not enough. And it's, it's also very important to make toys. When I was young, I made a lot of toys. From wheels and, and bottle caps and any kind of sticks and any kind of cups. I made a lot of toys. That is creativity. Now, since we were very young, we were creative. This is the nature of human beings. To be creative is very important. Then we play with other children too. We share the toys. toys. We are happy to share that. We are also very jealous too. We have both nature. We are jealous and we want you to share also. So sometimes we play, we share. Sometimes we are jealous. No, I won't give you my toy. And sometimes we fight. That is also necessary. We need to fight. And we need to learn how to fight well, how to play a fair game, a fair fighting game. Because this is learning to assert ourselves. Learning to try our limit. And also, in some ways we learn that the other person has also the right. We have our right, they have their right. So, learning to respect another person Limit also, and our limit also. Learning to cooperate with each other. If they don't play with us, then we won't have anybody to play with. So we know that I cannot do just what I want to do. I cannot be jealous all the time. I need to be generous, cooperate. So by playing with other children, we learn to relate to those people. And sometimes we hurt another person, sometimes another person hurt us. Sometimes we feel, it's okay, no, no problem, never mind. Sometimes we get very angry and upset. And then our parents say, oh, get along again. Sometimes you hurt another person, sometimes they hurt you, it's okay. Be friends again. So we learn that even though people hurt us, we should still relate with them. We cannot stop relating with them. If you stop relating with somebody who hurts you once, then you'll end up with nobody to relate to. Even your parents hurt you sometimes. Even my parents hurt me many, many times. So although we hurt each other, we know that. We need to learn, understand, forgive, and still keep on relating. So this is developing uh, to become more magnanimous. Very, very important to do that. 
So we grow up slowly and slowly, we become three years old, four years old, five years old. Then a very important change happens. And especially in modern days. What is that change? Very simple, going to school. And, but it's a very big change. I've talked with younger people. They express that it's a very big change in their life. Some people, even when they are about three years old, they go to school just for the fun of going. They are not, not required to do anything. So they slowly adapt to going to school and learn something too. So for them it's, it's easier. That transition is gradual. But for some people, suddenly their parents send them to school. Today you go to school. And the child couldn't adapt to that. And got very scared, terrified and cried. Become very tense. So this sensation is very, very important for a child. So at home, our parents, they look after us, pamper us, brothers and sisters, especially in a, in a very ex- big extended family. Grandparents, they pamper their grandchildren so much. Anytime you want to eat something, they'll give you this, eat this, eat this. And you want to or take a nap, just go into your grandmother's lap and just lie down and take a nap. She'll hold you in her arms. So nice to have a grandmother. So, but when you go to school, you can't take a nap whenever you want. You have to be there, attentive, learn something. You can't go and play with twice anytime you want. No, there's a time to play. There's a time to eat, there's a time to sleep, but there's also time to study to pay attention. So that's a big change which is necessary. So slowly and slowly we learn that. That's discipline. So discipline means to do something uh, good for now also and good for the future, for the benefit of the future. So you want to play now, but no, study now, play later. So this is a kind of restraint. It's very important. We need to learn to restrain. Restrain um, is something positive. We shouldn't think of restrain as something negative. But most people understand that. Restrain is positive. We need to do that. So discipline means to do something uh, for the benefit in the long run. So you restrain something that you want to do now. You stop doing that now. You wait. So to learn to wait, that's what you do when you go to school. You learn to wait. Well, I'll do this now, and I'll wait to play until I go back home. Until I go back home, I'll wait to to eat, and to sleep even. So we grow up slowly and slowly, uh, passing all the exams, working very hard, and our parents also motivating us, and we become teenagers. Another big change. Body, the body is changing. The body chemistry is changing. Sometimes we don't know what's happening. It's very scary. Sometimes our parents didn't tell us anything. Nobody told us anything. Something is happening, we don't know what. And we feel very strong emotions. Very scary. Don't know how to talk about it. So if our parents or some elder people explain what's happening, it's so much easier for us to adapt. And so, at that time, as we grow up, what we value changes. What is most important for us changes. Sometimes we know what we value, sometimes we know what's most important for us. But sometimes our parents, our teachers told us, tell us, now this is more important for you to do than the other thing. Do it now. So we learn what is most important for us at that time of our life, at that stage of our life. So we are in our teenage, we become rebellious, we become more assertive, we want to say I am. When we were young, our parents said this and that, we obey. But when we, are, when we begin uh, our teenage, 13, 14, 15, we uh, purposefully, deliberately, we say no sometimes. We just want our parents to know that we have our own likes and dislikes, we have our own preferences, we have our own thoughts and ideas. So we become more assertive, we become rebellious, which is very good actually, very positive, very good. So I want 
parents here and their younger people here too. And it is very important to understand this stage. What is the child doing? What are we doing at that time in our life? We want, we are learning to become independent. We are learning to stand on our own two feet. We are learning to decide for ourselves. But we should also learn to take responsibility. And this is something most people don't think of. They just want to rebel. They just want to be free. They don't want to be told. They don't want to take orders. But very gently, we should teach our children that this is okay for you to do, to become free, to become independent, to think for yourself. Self is very important for you because we will not be around all the time to tell you what to do. We will not be here always to look after you. You are learning to look after yourself. This is very positive, but be very careful not to make big mistakes. Be responsible too. So we need to help younger people to become independent also to be more responsible. If we do that very gently, respectfully, with kindness, with understanding, then they really learn and grow up. And rebellion mm, does not become something negative. Instead of rebelling, they become more responsible, more able, uh, they develop their qualities more, and we become more responsible. They can even help their parents in many ways. So at that time of our life, it's very, very important for learning to be independent. That's our highest value at that time. So at that time of our age, we are, are not children anymore. We are not young anymore, but we are not mature either. We are not grown up yet. We are in between. A very difficult time in our life. So most of you here are 40s, 50s. So we have been... We have passed through those stages and we know how difficult it was and how painful it was uh, to be misunderstood by our parents. We are learning to become independent. We are learning to rely on ourselves. We are learning to make our own decisions. We are learning to make our own choice. And sometimes our parents misunderstood us and they say that you are becoming more and more disobedient and make, make us feel very guilty. So most of you mm, have been through that. So it is very important for parents to understand this. It is a necessary change. At that time of life, this is the most important thing to do. This is the highest value for everybody. And so we go through our school and we finish our pre-college. So in our country it is called 10th standard. I don't know how you call that here. We call that 10th standard, and after that we go to college or university. So before that, we stay at home most of the time. We go to school and come back home. But after pre-college, when we go to college, most of us go away from home because um, for most people, there is no college in their hometown. So they have to go to another city, bigger city, to go to colleges, to go to universities, even here. To leave home and go to colleges. Mm. So then we are away from our parents. No, there's nobody else to tell us what to do or what not to do, with whom our, should, we should make friends or not, where to go or where not to go. We are free to do whatever we like. If we have not learned to take responsibility, to discipline ourselves, we could make serious mistakes and ruin our life. And many younger people do that. And it's such a waste. Sometimes I see younger people wasting away their lives, ruining their lives. Human potential. You know, human beings can become such beautiful, uh, noble beings. But all the potentials ruined, destroyed. So it is very important for parents to understand and also for children to understand what's happening, what needs to be done. So we need to teach our children values. What do you value now? Your values will change. Your values have to change. We can't tell three or four years old to go and meditate. 
Because at that time of the age, that's not their value. They are not mature enough to understand that. At that time, we should teach, teach our children to play well very well, to cooperate with friends. So as we grow older and older, we value something different, something different. Our values change. So our values should change. Without change, there will be no growth. So we can't stick to the same value all the time. So we go to college, we study hard, and we learn to relate to other people also. We are learning to find our life partners. And then we get a degree and find a job, work, make money, and then get married, make a home. If we make the right choice, then we'll have a very happy home. But it's so difficult to make the right choice because we are not mature enough. We get so addicted to people. We make the wrong choice. Sometimes we feel so lonely that we will just hold on to anybody and decide that this person will be my lifelong partner and lifelong husband or wife. But it doesn't last. Very sad story in America, 78% divorce. So at that time, it's very important for older people to teach the children how to make a good choice, how to find the right or good partner, good lifelong companion. And nobody teach that to us. Nobody taught me I made the wrong choice. So many people do the same. There's no college to teach you how to find a, a right partner, how to be a father, how to be a husband, how to be a wife, how to be a mother. Nobody teach that. As if that's the simplest thing we can do. Nobody needs to learn. Just do it. So you see, we, since our teenage, biologically we are mature. We can be a father or a mother since we are 14, 15, 16. But psychologically, we are not mature to be a father. We are not mature to be a husband. We are not mature to be a wife, to be a mother. So we need to teach children to become more mature to become a good husband, a good wife, a good mother, a good father, but nobody really teaches that. Because at that time in our life, that's very important thing to do. That's our highest value at that time. Natural. But at the same time, we are learning to do many other things too. Some people learn to meditate since they are in the teens. Very good, very good. They become more mature. They become more responsible. They make the right choice. So we grow up and we have children, and we look after our children. The children grow up, and then the children leave home. Now most of us are in our 40s, 50s, and we had, we had our dreams when we were young. Oh, when I grow up, I'll do this, I'll do that, that I'll be successful, and I'll be happy. We had a lot of dreams. Now, maybe some of you have realized your dreams, and most of you have your disappointments. That's okay, that's the way life is. Not all of our dreams will come true. So what do we need to do? We just need to change our dream, switch over to another dream. Can't stick to the same dream all of our life. I mean, change to another value, change to another goal, another thing that we really love to do. So when we were very young, three, four years old, we just love to play. We just like to eat chocolates. As we grow older and older, we start playing. And some people even stop eating chocolate. So anyway, it's changing all the time, changing. So we have to pay more attention. It will change, but where? Where is the direction? The direction of change is very important. It will change, no matter what, where, how. We can't stop changing. But we need to be more aware of the direction. So where are we going? So now most of us are 40s, 50s, and when we were young, our motivation, our goal was to get an education, to get a good job, to make money, to get married, to have children, to enjoy sense pleasures, to be happy. Uh, very good. Quite natural. But are we still going to do that now? Is that still our goal? 
No, it's over. We aren't going to school anymore. Maybe some of you are still mm, learning something new, going to colleges. But still, we need to have a better goal, a higher value. So the middle life is a time of supreme psychological importance. We are now, some of us are past middle life. And when is middle life? What age do we call middle life? We are not going to live for a hundred years, actually. Most of us will not live for a hundred years. Mm. Average, most of us will live for about seventy. Average lifespan. So if you divide it into two, thirty-five is middle. After thirty-five, it's afternoon. Not morning anymore, it's afternoon. It's going down, the sun is going down and down. So sometimes if you think about it, you feel frightened, no? Huh? It's already afternoon. I haven't even learned to live. It's already afternoon now. So the middle life is a time of supreme psychological importance. <clears throat> this adolescent teenage is also supreme psychological importance. And also, middle life, 35, 40, is supreme psychological importance. It's another kind of adolescence. Middle life is the moment of greatest unfolding. When we were young, we didn't have many experiences. We haven't learned anything yet. We just want to be happy, enjoy. So we thought, most of us thought that, well, 20s was the best time in my life. Most of us think that, that way. Oh, we enjoyed so much. And also some people suffered so much, even in the twenties, thirties, nightmares. One mistake after another, one mistake after another, after another. Loneliness after loneliness. Some people went through. But some people really enjoyed and happy when they were in the twenties, maybe still in the thirties. But as you grow older and older, it becomes harder and harder to enjoy sense pleasures. Although we have the habit to, to, to go on, to keep doing what we were used to doing. It, it was just a habit. So many of my friends, most of them Westerners, they told me that. They told me that, well, just because I'm used to doing these things, I'm still doing it. But I don't really enjoy it anymore. I, don't, I can't really get excited anymore. Every time after... after Every time after I've done it, I thought it wasn't as good as it was. It isn't as good as it was. And, but still can't stop doing it. Why? We cannot just stop doing something and just stay doing nothing. We have to do something else. And what is that? We don't know. Most of us don't know how to change. So it is very important to learn how to change even. It doesn't happen uh, uh, just by itself, because old habits die hard. Old habits die hard. The habit, the addiction is still going on and on. We are addicted to the things that we are used to doing. So middle life is the moment of greatest unfolding, which means we have a lot of experience in our life. We have enjoyed a lot of things, we have suffered a lot of things. We have learned quite a lot too from our mistakes also, so we are unfolding like a flower. We become mature. That's why some people say life begins at 40. So that's in a way it is true. So you have a lot of things. You have achieved a lot too. You have a lot of disappointments too. So some of you have fulfilled your dreams. Are you really fulfilled? Now, do you really feel feel fulfilled now? Are you really happy? Ask yourself these questions. You have money, house, position, status. Some people do have those things. Are you really happy? And most of us are very, very busy. I mean, most of you. I'm also very busy most of the time. I have no time to waste. 
So I keep myself busy most of the time. But I'm doing what I really love doing. I enjoy doing what I love, what I'm doing. Do you really enjoy doing what you are doing? Most of the time? Do you love what you are doing? Is your family life satisfying? These are very important things to ask. So one began to take account in the manner life has developed up to this point. To take account, to go back and see what happened. What have we done? What have I lived for? Thus, real motivations are sought, real discoveries made. So if we are wise enough, if we are mindful, if we look back our life, we can learn a lot from what we have done. From the good things and from the, our mistakes, from the suffering, from our happiness also. So that transition from morning to afternoon is a revaluation of earlier values. So we have lived a lot of values, a series of values through our life. But we should pay more attention and see. Revaluation of our values. We need to do that. So I told you a story about one of my friends, a doctor. Uh, he actually is a Canadian. Uh, a very intelligent man, very handsome, very tall also, a big man. Uh, his parents were also quite well-to-do, quite rich, educated, uh, successful in their lives. But he told me that his parents were atheists, which means they uh, don't believe in any religion, they don't practice anything religious. They just work and make money and happy. So they motivate him to study very hard. And he studied very hard and got an MD, became a big doctor, very, very successful. Got married to a very, very beautiful lady, very beautiful woman. I met them. And his work also was very successful, he made a lot of money, bought a very beautiful big house, big mansion even. And bought three cars, had one child, only child, a daughter. But when he was in his early 40s, Slowly and slowly, he lost motivation to go to work. In the morning, he would think, I don't want to go to work. He's been doing the same thing again and again. It's not something new or difficult, but it becomes a routine. He worked and he earned money, but he didn't feel any real satisfaction, no joy. Go to the hospital and look after the patient and did operations and get money, come back home. And doing the same thing again and again. So life became a routine. Slowly, slowly and slowly, he lost motivation. Sometimes he would not go to hospital anymore. He would just ring and say, I'm not coming today. Or just postpone the operations. And it happened more and more like that. And he also lost interest in his wife, in his child. He won't talk with them much. Give them enough money. If they ask for help, he will help them. But otherwise, not interested. Slowly and slowly he lost interest in almost everything. And he was worrying, why? I don't want to do anything now. Nothing really interests me anymore. I can't enjoy anything. So he took a long leave and went away into the country and did many things that he thought would make him very happy. And after doing all that, he still felt not satisfied, not happy. So after a while, it, it, it became very unbearable. And he went to a psychiatrist. And the, the psychiatrist said, Well, you're suffering from... And you can tell what it is. Depression, yes. But when the doctor said, You're suffering from depression, that doesn't mean anything. It, the same thing, it means you have lost interest. You have lost motivation. Which means the same thing. But why? A very intelligent and successful man, a rich man who has got everything he needed, he told me that I've got everything that I wanted, I've got everything that anybody wants, but still, I'm not interested in anything anymore. So they gave him some medicine and also some other treatment too. Sometimes it worked a little bit, sometimes not. He couldn't come out of that. So at last he totally quit his job won't go to the hospital anymore. Just stay in his room, watching television. 
at last he lost total interest in, her, in his family. He said, you can go now, do whatever you like. So they separated, sent the child to boarding school, and then sold the house, sold two cars, left only one car, and then traveling around in the car, everywhere, staying anywhere, experimenting with new ways of living. And he became something like a hippie. He stopped shaving or cutting his hair, he stopped shaving. And he used to be a very neat and disciplined man, but he became a very sloppy person, very undisciplined. He would eat when he likes to eat, sometimes he won't. And he used drugs also. And dressing also in a very slack shirts and trousers, baggy trousers and pullovers. Very untidy, he became very untidy. And when his friends met him, they were very sorry for him, but they couldn't do anything. So at last, he didn't want even to live in his country anymore. He wanted to go away, away. He felt like he was trapped. Trapped in what? Very important to answer that question. So he sold everything, even his car, and left only a small bag to carry on his back and got a passport and money and went to say goodbye to a friend. And he told his friend, I've sold everything, I'm now leaving my country. And my wife and I also separated. And if I can throw away this passport and money, then I'll be really free. That's what he said. Try to understand what he was feeling. Maybe you can relate to that. To a certain extent even. So his friend said, even if you throw away your passport and money, you will not be free. Which is very true. Freedom does not, does not happen just by throwing away what you have. Freedom happens in your mind, your understanding, your deep wisdom. Only can give you freedom, nothing else. So he left the country, traveled all over the, the world, mostly Asian countries, because he said he was sick with this, this Western materialistic culture competitive culture. He was very, very sick of that. So he came to the East. Uh, he was an atheist, as I told you, so not interested in any religious practice. But in the East, he met one of his friends, who was and is in a very good meditator. So he arranged his life very neatly. He worked and saved money and he meditated. Sometimes he travels. And quite happy to a certain extent. So when they met each other, they discussed about their life. And then this friend who is a meditator said, I can't tell you much, but I want to give you one advice. Why don't you try meditation? So this person who is, was so desperate thought that, well, I'll try it. I want to do anything. I'm open to anything. I just want to live my life uh, meaningfully and feel satisfied. Now I have been doing so many things and nothing really satisfies me. And that was very, very painful. So he took this good advice from this good friend and then went into a meditation center and took a retreat for 10 days. So you see, this man is ready to give up anything. And that's a very important point. He was tired of sense pleasure. <coughs> of everything actually. So he went into this retreat center and took this 10 day course and sat and meditated. He said the first three days were like hell. To sit still for 10 hours, 12 hours, not easy to do. Try for one hour even, not easy to do. And the mind, so agitated, so unsatisfied. But he tried it. He was determined to do it. So he tried it. After three, four days, he, became, he said his mind became calmer and calmer. And after seven, eight days, he felt very peaceful and calm sometimes. Even for a brief moment, four, five minutes, just pure peacefulness. Not the whole day. During the whole day meditating, sometimes about five minutes, he became so calm and peaceful, he thought, this is real freedom. No thought, no desire. No pain in the body, no pain in the mind. 
just pure peacefulness. And he said, this is what I want. So he finished one course and then he took another course, another course, another course and he kept taking that. For a long, long time, I don't remember how long, but for years. Because he didn't want to do anything else. And in that center they lived very simply, he ate their vegetarian meals and meditate all day. One hour sitting, ten minutes break, another hour sitting, ten minutes break, another hour sitting, ten minutes break, and eat your meal, wash yourself, relax for a while, sitting, sitting, sitting the whole day, like that. But he tried and tried. And then later he developed very deep insights, vipassana insights. And then I can't tell you exactly where he reached, how much he uh, attained, but he developed very deep understanding of the nature of mind, of the nature of happiness, of the nature of unhappiness, of the nature of peace, of the nature of clarity, the nature of wisdom. So after he reached to that state and he reflected on what he did all his life, he saw all that happened very clearly. And in that meditation center, they also practice metta meditation, loving kindness, compassion. So when he felt very calm and peaceful, then he thought of each person, and he, he noticed and felt for them. He said, everybody is carrying so much pain, so much frustration, so much disappointment, looking for something desperately, but not knowing what. So this happens, you know, we are looking for something that will satisfy us. We don't know what. But this person, he found, he said, this is very satisfying. And this is what I want. So he found happiness and peacefulness inside, not outside. Though, so this materialistic culture is brainwashing people, making people believe that you can find happiness if you can buy more expensive things. This is a con, this is a trick. And we have been tricked into that. And we believe that. And we've been disappointed many, many times and we still want to believe it. So this doctor, uh, when he radiated his loving kindness and compassion toward all the people near him and far away, and including his former wife, and when he thought of her, he felt so much compassion. He felt her pain, her loneliness, her rejection. Uh, the, he left her, so he, she felt rejected. She felt unloved, not worthy of love. So when he radiated his matter, Corona, he felt her pain. So he went back to his home, home into his country, and went to see his former wife. And open up himself and express how he felt and why he did all those things, all those terrible things to himself and to others. With so, with so much honesty and openness, he expressed all that and he remarried her. Very beautiful actually. So one might think that, why a meditator marrying again? <laughs> But he told me his story very openly and honestly. He said, when I first married her, it was because of my passion for her. She was very beautiful. Because of her beauty, because of her body, I married her. Believing that she can make me feel fulfilled. I can enjoy her. She can give me enjoyment, pleasure, happiness. But later, that beauty fades away. And you can't make anybody happy all the time. Nobody is responsible for your happiness. You can't rely on that. But later she, he lost interest in her. her. Her beauty fades away, naturally. But now, he said, he said, I remarry her because of my compassion for her. She's been so good to me all her life. I didn't notice that. I didn't see that. Why? Because he was so selfish. He couldn't see that. Now he became not so selfish. He became very compassionate and he can see what she did, what she has done for him all her life. 
she, she, she gave the best of her, her life to him. But he was not satisfied. So he rejected her. So he felt all that and he apologized also for that. And they became very good friends. Now he wants her to meditate and find that peace in herself. Now he wants to support her to meditate. Do this. I've done this. You can see that I'm not happier. Happy, but I cannot. But I want to support you so that you will find happiness, peacefulness inside. So his wife also meditated. And uh, because they meditate for a long, long time, of course they make progress and experience some quietness, peacefulness, clarity, some sort of freedom relatively. And he went back to his old job again. And he said, before, I want more patience because I want more money. Now he said, I want less patience because I want to pay more attention. Now I am patient. Now I am not impatient anymore. Now I am patient, very patient. Now I can talk to a person. Now I can listen to a person. Now I am really willing to understand his or her health problem, mental problem, family problem, job problem, any kind of problem. Now I want to help another person in every way I can, not just getting medicine and operation. Now I want to treat another person's life, not just a disease or a symptom. You see how he changed? This person, this friend of mine, his story is so wonderful. We can learn so much from his story. The right attitude to do anything. So he said, no, I don't treat a patient. I don't, I treat a life. The whole life. So whenever a patient comes, he will talk, he will listen, ask about the family, ask about job, ask about thoughts, mental states, fears, anxieties, worries, depression, anything. And he gave medical treatment also, and he did meditation also. He said, no matter what your religion is, you can believe your religion, but practice mindfulness. That will improve your mind, and that will improve your life, that will improve your health, that will improve your work. That will improve the whole thing, the whole life. So he's been doing that for many, many years now. He worked for six months, saved the money, making less money actually, but because he's not wasting, he's not buying any luxuries. He lived a very simple life, so he saved a lot of money. Working six months and meditating and teaching meditation for six months. Now he has balanced his life. He's now just over 50 now slightly older than me. So he has made his life two parts. Working and making money and at the same time, even working, he said, is my spiritual practice now. I'm not working just for money. So even work becomes more satisfying because his attitude has changed so much. So to make something satisfying, look into your heart and see why you are doing it. Do you have the right attitude, the right motivation? Are you doing with loving kindness and compassion? Or are you doing with selfish motivation? With selfish motivation, you might get money, but you will never get real satisfaction. And when your life is over, you might think that I've sold my life, but still I have got nothing. So these are very important things that we can learn from another person's life experience. And for me, everybody is a drama for me. You, Dharma, you, Dharma, you, Dharma, everybody is Dharma for me. You tell me your story, I can see Dharma there. I read a storybook, I can see Dharma there. Even when I read subatomic particle physics books, uh, astrophysics books, I see Dharma, Dharma there. Everywhere is Dharma. In your life, whatever is happening in your life, it's Dharma. You just need to look at it from the right perspective. With, with the right way to look at it. So if you have the right way to look, Everywhere you look, there is Dharma. You can't escape from Dharma, because everything is Dharma. Buddha said, Satu Satya Unimoto Dhammo Namanati. Nothing is beyond the Four Noble Truth. Everything happening fits into the Four Noble Truth. So you will see either of the Four Noble Truth there, wherever you look. So you only need to see, to find out how to look.
So the transition from morning to afternoon is a revaluation of earlier values, of becoming aware of the error in our former condition. So we have our own condition. This is right, this is wrong. But as we grow up from our experience, life experience and from our learning, from our practice, from our meditation, we find out that my condition were, some of them at least, were wrong. So we give up. Wrong condition. And take new values of recognizing the falsehood in what had before been true. Before we thought something is true, but later we know that this is not true anymore. So give up. The readiness to give up the change is very important. So another story came into my mind now, but look at the clock. I have no time to tell you another story. I wish I can turn it back. So anyway, forget about the time. I eat every day. I had my breakfast already. So thoroughly unprepared, we take the step into the afternoon of life. Not only into the afternoon, thoroughly unprepared, we, do, we take step and step and step. We never really prepare. That's why yesterday also I took some of the people, prepare yourself, prepare yourself. Well prepared is half done. Without prepared, you'll be very frustrated, no matter what you do. So thoroughly unprepared, we take the steps into the afternoon of life. So don't think that the afternoon of life is not as good as the morning of life. Actually, it should be better. The afternoon should be better, more satisfying. So our life demands many things. When we were very young, it demands something. To play, to enjoy, to make money, to get married. That this is what our life demands. It's nature. But as we grow older and older, that is not our demand anymore. We can't keep going doing those things anymore. We need to change. So what do what does our life demand? Our life demands to develop our inner qualities, our spiritual qualities. That's what our life demands. But we don't take heed. We believe more on the commercials than what our real heart tells us what is really good for us. We believe, we look at the commercials, the advertisement, and believe that if I get that, I'll be happy. So we believe in commercials more than we believe in our own deep yearning. So worse still, we take this step with the false presupposition that our truth and ideals will serve us as it is. So our ideals and truths when we were young are not suitable anymore. Just like old shirts, take it off, throw it away. I mean, we need to change. <clears throat> but we cannot live the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning. We need to change the program. Our body changing, body chemistry is changing. So what was great in the morning will be little in the evening. The development of culture is a process which consists as we knew of a progressive taming of the animal side of man. So, <clears throat> what is culture? So, perfection is culture. So, if we learn to develop our spiritual qualities and relatively become better and better, then that means we are uh, cultivating ourselves, which is called culture. It is the privilege and task of riper age that has past the meridian of life to produce culture. So it's time for us now, especially those who are beyond 35, to produce culture, to develop our own inner qualities and as much as possible set a good example for younger people and also impart our knowledge to them. To, to make ourselves, to try ourselves to become a better human being and give that to another person. This is the way we should live. To set a good example. So those who are mature produce culture. Only those who are mature can produce culture. Culture is not just singing, not just dancing, not just making sculptures. Culture, real culture is deep inside, invisible. So most of us care more 
for what we can see with our eyes only. But what's most important is something that we cannot see with our eyes. It's hidden deep in us. So we have to be a good example for younger people. Teach them how to become a better human being. But first, before we teach them, we must develop ourselves. Then only we can teach them. Otherwise, the culture will go down and down. People will become more aggressive, more uncaring, more selfish. And they will destroy themselves. And they will destroy everybody. The money-making, social existence, family and posterity are nothing but plain nature, not culture. Culture lies beyond the purpose of nature. So beyond the purpose of nature means to get married is nature. But even to treat your partner with real kindness is culture. With real caring, with real matter, with real compassion is culture. With real honesty, openness, respect, so much. We have those qualities already. We have them. The impact has the potential as a seed. We don't need to go around and look for it. It's already in us. But when we reach a higher cultural level, we must forego compulsion and turn to self-development. So, we are ready to do now. This is the best, the best time for us to do that. Self-development. When we were young, we were too busy to do those other things. But now we have done most of those things and we may still have to go on doing, working, making some money. But at the same time, we need to take time to really develop our inner quality. Man has two aims. The first aim is the aim of nature, the begetting of children and all the business of protecting the brood. To this period belongs the gaining of money and social position. When this aim is satisfied, there begin another phase, namely that of culture. Another phase, another more important phase. For the attainment of the former goal, we have the help of nature and moreover of education. But little or nothing helps us toward the latter goal. So to make money, to get a job, we have training, job training, many kinds of job training. But very little training to develop our own quality. So here, for example, this society here is for that purpose, to develop our inner qualities. So we need to pay more attention to this. We need to get together and work for that, help each other, support each other to develop our inner culture. To so spend more time, also spend more money for it. Because without money we cannot do anything. We are not for money. I'm not asking for money. Because that is the least. That's the worst thing I want to do. Mm. Greedy for money, no. But, we need to do many things here. We need all your support. And it's for you and for me. Not just for one particular person. It's for you, it's for me. It's for all of us. Not for selfish purpose, not because of greed. So, take this more seriously. Think about it. We need each other. We need to develop our inequality. The development of culture is a process which consists, as we know, of the progressive taming of the animal side of man. So I think I've mentioned all the important points I want to say, and I can't finish this anymore. So anyway, this time in our life is a very important time. We need to pay more attention, we need to spend more time, more energy to develop culture. So I hope you have understood this. And what I have said today here now, it's not complete. I'm only giving you a hint, some hint, so that you can think about it and develop uh, the importance, the meaning, more and more. Just listening for a few minutes is not enough. So to do something, we need to participate. Even to understand what I'm trying to say, if you really want to understand, you have to put uh, my ideas in your life. Because your life is the context. Without putting the idea in your life and see the idea in that context, you will not really understand it. It will be just words. 
you hear it and you forget it. But if you put the idea in your life and practice it, then it will become real. Then it will become meaningful. Meaning is not just in words. Meaning is in your life. So, let's work harder. Pay more attention to develop our inner culture here. So, I will conclude our meeting here for now. Yes, you want to say something, please? Thank you, Vendabal, sir. For the sake of those who have not heard about the play, Siddharth, King Siddharth, which is going to be staged in a fortnight, I, would, I keep on telling this, giving this announcement week after week, because the sale of articles is very poor. And uh, as Vendabal Monk just said, now we need funds for various activities. We can't get good months like Vendabal Joe because we don't have money. We can't pay our electricity, we can't pay our gas bills and maintain the place without funds. So we really need your support. And uh, it's Prince Siddhartha, a dramatization of the early life of the Buddha. And this was a play written by Michael Wills, a long-standing member of the association of our society. And the date is on Saturday the 26th of April, which is Saturday week, at 6.30 p.m., at the Alexander Theatre, Monash University, Clayton. Adult tickets are priced at $15 and children's tickets are $10. So kindly contact me or any of the committee members for tickets. I would like to ask each one of you if you could kindly sell at least three or four or five tickets. If you can make an attempt and do that, it will be a great help to us. Thank you. So let's conclude our meeting here by paying honoring Buddha Dharma and Sangha. I honor the Buddha by the very practice that leads to liberation. I honor the Dharma by the very practice that leads to liberation. I honor the Sangha by the very practice that leads to liberation.